Uber has its fair share of competition in America. Popular rideshare options like Lyft may seem like a threat to the Uber empire. However, when you look at the numbers, you'll see Uber is miles ahead of competition in the United States. According to Bloomberg, Uber takes in 68% of American rideshare spending, with 63% of rideshare users claiming loyalty to Uber. But how come Uber never stood a chance in Asia? Uber began as UberCab back in 2009, birthed from the mind of Garrett Camp. Camp and his friends spent roughly $800 on New Year's Eve hiring a private driver, so Camp wanted to find a way to reduce the cost of a private driver. His idea was to split the cost with a lot of people to make it affordable. His idea was making it like bottle service for the high-end customers at a nightclub, except for cars. Uber Cab launched publicly in San Francisco in 2011. They eventually shortened its name to Uber after receiving numerous complaints from San Francisco taxi drivers. As Camp wanted, Uber initially launched as a luxury car service that anyone could access. A sleek black car would pick you up and drop you off in style. They also emphasized no tipping, something that's completely different today. Of course, as demand grew, Uber shifted gears. They began allowing drivers to use any vehicle, not just luxury vehicles, to pick up customers through UberX, and the ability to tip on the app was added later. Uber Eats launched in 2014 to compete with Grubhub and DoorDash, even with both being well-established players in the food delivery business. In February of 2021, Uber announced the purchase of the Boston-based alcohol delivery company Drizzly for $1.1 billion. With astounding success in the United States, Uber sought to branch its rideshare dominance to other parts of the world. But when they tried moving into Southeast Asia, they came up against their biggest challenge yet. Uber entered the Southeast Asian market right around 2013. For several years, their business strategy focused on becoming the dominant source of rideshare services in countries such as Indonesia and Malaysia. Why was this area so appealing? Well, since the rise of the smartphone era, Southeast Asia has seen rapid growth in smartphone users since 2015. Projections in 2017, according to TechCrunch, estimated the population of smartphone users in Southeast Asia at upwards of 480 million by 2020. And smartphone users make up the biggest share of Southeast Asia's internet population. Roughly 90% of internet users there are smartphone users. For Uber, those projections were too good to ignore. If there were ever a time to pounce on international expansion, it was then. However, two major rideshare companies stood in their way. The Malaysian company Grab had been an established entity in the area long before Uber arrived. In Indonesia, Gojek was dominating the market with their own expansion plans ready in their back pocket. Uber found itself playing catch-up to both companies as they expanded to other Southeast Asian countries. Uber wasn't trying to be the dominant force in Southeast Asia, they were simply trying to match them. But Grab always seemed one step ahead, moving into countries such as the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam months before Uber did. Meanwhile, Gojek claimed an edge over Uber in Indonesia, as it was far more familiar with the Indonesian market and culture. For starters, Gojek leveraged their massive motorcycle fleet to provide quicker rides through the crowded streets of Jakarta, the capital city. While Uber drivers were stuck in traffic jams, Gojek's motorcycles could safely weave in and out of cars, a practice frowned upon in most of the United States, but commonplace in Indonesia. In fact, Jakarta's traffic is so bad, famed Indonesian novelist Seno Gumira Ajadharma claims that the average Jakartan will spend 10 years of their life in traffic. While that may not exactly be accurate, anyone visiting the city can easily understand how severe gridlock can get. Roughly three and a half million people commute into the city every day. Uber's rivals have found a way to adapt to their given situations. They've outgrown Uber by a landslide, forcing them to cut their losses in Southeast Asia. What are the companies Grab and Gojek, and how did they hold off Uber? Grab's understanding of Southeast Asian culture and their early move to international expansion were two critical factors. Grab launched in the Malaysian capital of Kuala Lumpur in 2012. Within that year, they moved into Singapore and the Philippines capital, Manila. At the time, the most significant difference between Grab and Uber, 
and one that may have acted as an early nail in the coffin, was Grab's cash-friendly service. All Uber transactions were done over the app via credit card. Grab understood Malaysia's affinity for cash payments. While most of Southeast Asia moved to cashless payments, Malaysia held out. Even in 2021, 64% of their point-of-sale transactions are made in cash, compared to 21% for credit cards. But it wasn't just flexible payment methods that put Grab ahead of Uber. Independent drivers are at the heart of the rideshare business. Those drivers have different needs that may not fit with Uber's bi-weekly pay period. Through the Grab Pay app, drivers were paid immediately after a ride. Drivers deciding whether to work for Grab or Uber were more inclined to choose Grab. More Grab drivers means more rides, and that of course means more revenue than Uber. Grab also kept its finger on the pulse of the local workforce. They hired local tech teams in each new area and worked with local investors to grow the company. Contrarily, Uber relied heavily on an American workforce to populate their overseas offices. They also continued relying on American investors to grow. Grab's focus on local investors with local influence also helped them edge out their rival, Gojek, in the Philippines. In 2019, local investors ensured Grab's continued success while blocking Gojek's attempts at obtaining a ride-sharing license. Grab has evolved from the ride-sharing app at the beginning to a full-fledged super app through the years. They've expanded to offer food delivery and even an e-wallet similar to Venmo or PayPal. In April of 2021, Grab announced plans to go public in the United States after partnering with Altimeter Growth Corporation, a special purpose acquisition company, or SPAC. Special purpose acquisition companies are basically shell companies set up to raise capital to acquire private companies. The merger gave Grab a $39.6 billion valuation, making it the largest SPAC merger in history. Nadia Makaram was finishing his MBA at Harvard Business School when he founded Gojek remotely with his friends back home in Indonesia. Coincidentally, Grab founders Anthony Tan and Hui Ling Tan were also studying at Harvard Business at the same time. Gojek began as a call-in service via phone or Twitter to book Ojek rides. Ojeks are taxis, except on motorbikes in Indonesia. Ojeks were what got people through Jakarta's gridlock traffic. While the call-in formula didn't show signs of growth, Southeast Asia's rapid growth in smartphone use forced Gojek founders to switch to an app-based ride-hailing service. However, instead of just doing ride shares, Gojek expanded its variety of services to outpace the competition. Within the first year, they began offering food and prescription medicine delivery, along with their own payment app. To put their rapid growth in perspective, it took Uber five years to launch Uber Eats, and Amazon spent its first four years as an online bookstore. Eventually, Indonesians could get anything they wanted through Gojek. At one point in time, you could have even booked service and repair workers on the app. Gojek also offered roadside assistance and truck rentals to anybody in need. Those services proved to bolster their early years, but have since dissolved. Now, Gojek focuses on running three super apps, GoPay, GoPlay, and Go2. GoPay is a financial app, allowing users to manage investments, pay bills, and send and receive money. PayPal bought 100% of GoPay as of 2021, making it the first foreign payment firm to operate in China. Just as a reminder, China is the world's largest digital payment market. GoPlay is Gojek's streaming service, offering Indonesian films and TV series along with GoPlay Originals. While GoPlay isn't exactly competing with Netflix now or most likely anytime soon, Uber can't say they offer a streaming service, can they? GoTo is perhaps the biggest money move in recent Gojek history. Gojek partnered with Tokopedia, an Indonesian e-commerce giant, to form GoTo. Now, GoTo is Indonesia's largest digital consumer platform. They offer e-commerce and financial services to over 100 million active users every month. According to a Google study, the e-commerce market of Southeast Asia is expected to reach $300 billion by 2025. With Indonesia accounting for 41% of that estimated market, the race for super app supremacy between Grab and Gojek is on. Meanwhile, Uber has completely pulled out. 
Uber never had a chance competing against Grab and Gojek's market and cultural knowledge. After entering the market in 2013, Uber sold its assets in Southeast Asia to Grab for a minority stake in the company. Uber's move to invest in its competitors echoes their departure from other companies as well. Uber couldn't overcome Yandex in Russia, an internet company that provides over 70 internet-based products and services, which include food and grocery delivery, rideshare, and e-commerce. Just as in Southeast Asia, Uber lost out to yet another super app offering everything Uber was and more. Uber did own a 36.5% stake in Yandex in early 2018, but by the end of August of 2021, Yandex bought Uber out completely from all its businesses. Uber learned how to admit defeat in China when it lost to Didi, the dominant Chinese rideshare service. Uber entered the Chinese market in 2015, but never seemed to find a foothold. According to then-CEO Travis Kalanick, Uber was losing a billion dollars operating every year in China. Meanwhile, Didi closed on a $4.5 billion fundraising deal in 2016, with a billion coming from Apple. Knowing that they were fighting an uphill battle, Uber sold its stake in China to Didi for a minority stake in the company. That stake was valued at almost $8 billion by the end of 2018. Uber currently owns a 12% stake in Didi, but its value has been dwindling as China cracks down on its mainland companies going public in the US. Didi became a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange in June of 2021. That was considered a slap in the face to Chinese regulators. Now facing unprecedented penalties from the Chinese government, Didi is looking at a rumored $2.8 billion fine. After admitting defeat in Southeast Asia, Uber agreed to sell its assets to Grab in 2018 for a 27% stake in the company. The deal at that time was worth $2.2 billion. Grab's most recent valuation put them at $14 billion in 2021, increasing the value of Uber's shares to $3.2 billion, a billion dollar increase. Even though Uber's departure from Southeast Asia is branded as a failure, the company did secure over $12.5 billion worth of equity. Over the years, Uber has already made at least $3 billion in gains from having equity in their former competitors. Stiff competition wasn't the only factor that drove Uber out of certain countries. Moral quandaries over data privacy in China and Egypt forced Uber to pull out of their respective markets. The Egyptian government requested Uber to hand over their live data on their customers' travel habits. In exchange, Uber would receive preferential treatment. Uber simply refused to hand over private data and was ordered by an Egyptian court to halt service in the country. Before selling out to Didi, Uber faced more private data requests from the Chinese government. Furthermore, China has strict regulations on foreign companies making digital maps of the country. Uber is a big believer in autonomous vehicles. However, for such vehicles to work, they need a highly detailed map of the country in which they're operating. China's regulations made it borderline impossible for non-Chinese ride-sharing companies to ever get off the ground. Click to watch one of these next videos.